On today's show, we go to Cambridge, Ontario, to tell you the tale of the ghosts that haunt the old Galt post office. And we go into Ontario's Algonquin Park, where the ghost of artist Tom Thompson still paddles his canoe. And we go to Nordegg, Alberta, once a thriving mining town, now a ghost town, literally. We investigate a doppelganger seen frequently on Beacon Hill in Victoria, British Columbia. And we go to Bonavista Bay in Newfoundland, where an entire community lives with the restless spirits of the mysterious coffins that continue to wash up there. In the heart of Cambridge, Ontario, is one of the oldest buildings in the province, the old Galt Post Office. Today, the building houses the Fiddler's Green Pub, but the history of the building remains within its walls as a spectral presence. It is a dark history of death by suicide, or possibly even murder. I was alone cleaning up for the night. All the customers were gone, and I started feeling really odd. I started feeling cold. I noticed that it, it was very unusual. I couldn't, I didn't know what it was from. I went to leave the room, and I was stopped. I was, heard a big thud behind me. It sounded like a, a sack of potatoes dropped. I turned around, but I didn't see anything there. Then all of a sudden, I started having a panic attack almost. My whole body was, was, I was out of breath. I couldn't catch my breath. I felt like I was choking. I felt like I was taking on something that was happening to someone else. Feelings didn't belong to me. It's never reoccurred. I've never felt that feeling again. I know it was a result of being in that room. And I've never gotten in that room alone again since that time. The old Galt Post Office in Ontario is a setting for a fairy tale turned sour. This is the tale of two forbidden lovers caught in a web of deceit. Instead of living happily ever after, the lovers in this story face an eternity of sadness. The story you're about to see begs the question, is it possible to love somebody to death? William Turnbull was the postmaster of Galt from 1898 to 1919. He and his wife occupied the tower and third floor of the building. Emily was the post office cleaner. 19 years old, she was young and beautiful. It was only a matter of time before Emily became the object of William's affections. And before long, the older man won the young girl's heart. For three years, a romance developed between them, an illicit affair that continued under the very noses of the other staff. More importantly, William's wife, sometimes catching the pair huddled together, was becoming suspicious. A team of paranormal investigators from Haunted Hamilton have come to the Fiddler's Green to try to make contact with its ghostly inhabitants. My name is Jeff. We're at the Fiddler's Green Irish Pub in Cambridge. Today I'm here with Kate, Stephanie, Debbie, and Steve. We are paranormal investigators. And we are standing on the second floor, which used to be where Emily and William used to rendezvous. I guess we'll start and see if we can pick up and do a little walk around, see if we can pick up any impressions. There's a lot of fighting going on here. It's not so much the love affair. I don't think this is where they came to rendezvous so much as to argue. I could see her looking out the window, looking out at the river. 
these buildings, there weren't so many buildings here. She's watching the trees and the river, wishing that she was somewhere else. There's annoyance and sadness all at the same time. This is probably closer to the end of the relationship than the beginning. It's more her than him. He's just very cold. There's really no emotion attached to him at all. I was DJing at the pub, you know, regular gig, and wrapping up my gear for the night. Everything was done. Coming down the ladder. Right when I hit the bottom, all the disco lights popped back on. And I thought to myself, someone's got to be up there joshing me, you know, I mean, what is this? And I spin around and no one's up there. And I turn back around and there's this really familiar looking girl who's wearing a green dress. And I thought, you know, maybe she must have been one of the waitresses. So I asked her, you know, do you need any help? You know, is there something I could do? And she must have been checking my eyes, she vanished. She reappeared, like I thought, maybe two or three more places. And I booked, I was out of there. I told everybody at the pub, I don't bother calling me, I'm never coming back. Emily and William would often meet late at night on the third floor. But one night she waited in vain for William to arrive. Emily urgently needed to speak to him. The next day, she confronted him and revealed that she was pregnant. He told Emily she must leave town. Horrified by his coldness, she slapped him. William became very angry and struck her forcefully several times, knocking her down, before turning his back on her forever. Two days later, Emily was found hanged in William's third floor bedroom. His wife found the body. Was this suicide? Or did William end his problems in a brutal and expedient fashion? Or did the jealous wife take her own revenge? One thing is certain, the broken-hearted Emily still haunts the Fiddler's Green today. So now we're, we are up on the third floor, which is uh, where William and his wife used to live when this was a post office, the old Galt post office. She was hung here. Mm -hmm. We're asking if this is where she hung herself off of this part of the rafter. Clockwise spin is positive, counterclockwise is negative, so this is very positive yes answer. Some people think that the spirit is actually moving the pendulum. I prefer to think that it's more of uh, contacting your higher consciousness with the theory, I guess, that everybody knows the answers to all questions. We know everything past, present, and future. I think there's more conscious energy over there in the bell tower, though. I think there was some secret meeting going on back there. There was something. This has all been taken down. There would have been a doorway right there. If you come in here, you can feel it. They were very racy. It's something almost about potentially being seen through the window here. They're very small windows and high up, so they probably wouldn't have been, but there was something very exciting about being in this room. He was doing this to spice up his life. She was hoping that he would leave his wife. Emily is here. But I don't think he cared enough to stay around. When we come back, owner Marv Cohen joins a seance to contact Emily. Well, it's an 1885 building. We, uh, my son bought this building eight years ago. I said I'd come and help him a little bit. I've never worked so hard in my life. But it's a very, very interesting place. Um, uh, it was built in 1885 by the same builder who built the original parliament buildings in Ottawa that burnt down. And we have tried to reconstruct and keep it going, fix all of the different uh, areas that need to be fixed because it's just it's 1885. But over the years, we've, uh, we've come into very many unnatural sightings. Many of the time I would come up, especially in the winter, which is quite amazing, I'd maybe show it once a week, and I'd find the windows wide open, cold. As we started to go up the stairs, the cold would be coming down, just blowing down. And I screwed in about four long four-inch screws into the, uh, into the window, right into the sill, to make sure that it would, wouldn't open. 
and I'd come in the next day and, and I'd feel a cold draft coming down there. I'd go up there and there'd be the screws lying on the floor, window wide open, flapping in the wind again. And away I'd screw them all in again. I'd get them, you know, really tight. And again, the next week, felt the cold and they were lying on the ground, the screws and the window flapping again. It has been suggested that after a hundred years of heartache, Emily wants to be set free. And that's why the windows and doors fly open to the world outside. Okay, we're on the, the main floor of the post office where all the postal activity would have taken place. We were just up on the third floor and Kate was directed to come down here by Emily. Do you want to come down and help us? Yeah. Okay, what, what happens here is the energy goes through the table and then the spirit Whoever's uh, here will start tipping the table. You spend a lot of time in here, right? So. A lot. She must really like you. Maybe that's mm, why she's going to at you. I push you to do anything. She's a friendly ghost. Emily, we need to try and figure out yes and no using the table tipping. Can you show us what you're going to do if your answer is yes? Okay, we're going to lean toward Marvin. Yes. What's the answer for no? completed our investigation of Fiddler's Green. Uh, the psychics have uh, received impressions of uh, Emily. Um, she was upstairs, and I guess she came downstairs to talk to us. Uh, they tried the table tipping, which was quite interesting. Uh, we put some questions out to her. Uh, we got yes questions, we got no questions, and we got some table tipping. So for all of you watching, anybody who wants a nice ghostly experience while you're dancing and enjoying a drink, I think this is definitely the place. An ill-fated romance binds two troubled spirits to this old building in the heart of Galt. Visitors to the Fiddler's Green are encouraged to come and enjoy a pint of ale. But don't be surprised if you are joined by the restless spirits who still live here. Algonquin Wilderness Park is a sanctuary for outdoorsmen looking for adventure. But on beautiful Canoe Lake, Adventure has been known to take a particularly chilling turn. My brother and I were on a canoe trip in the park. It was the morning of our final day. We were up early packing things away as the mist was still rising off the lake. As I began to pack the canoe, I, I looked out into the lake and saw a man in a canoe silently moving through the morning fog. Well, I was really surprised that anyone was up at that time of the morning. As I looked, I noticed he had this huge gash on the side of his face. So I called out to him. Do you need help? But he didn't answer me. He just paddled away in his canoe and disappeared into the morning mist. In the shadow of Algonquin Park's interior, a forlorn specter travels the waterways in a ghostly canoe. A phantom spirit is said to be seeking revenge for a suspicious, premature death and the desecration of a late night grave robbery. Thompson was like the worst artist when he began. He was really bad. And we'd like to suppress some of the horrible things he did, but remember, he was a commercial artist. His whole family had painted, and he did too, as an amateur. And how did he become the artist that he was? It was through his friendships among what later became the Group of Seven. He took hold because of their help. It was only the work of his maturity that's of interest, and his maturity just lasted really three years, 1914 to 1917. 
A lady named Irene Ewing knew Tom Thompson in her youth. She recalls watching him paint at a friend's cottage on Canoe Lake. He truly belonged to the wilds. My grandmother told me of a fall afternoon when the trees have lost the last of their leaves. He stood and painted the scenery in front of him as she stood beside him and watched the wonderful ways that he reproduced the scenery. Although Tom Thompson may not have known it at the time, the subject of the painting, Canoe Lake, would also be the setting for his untimely demise. It was a death surrounded by mystery. On July 8th, 1917, Tom Thompson set off in his canoe to go fishing on nearby Gill Lake. Two days later, his upturned canoe was found, but there was no sign of the artist. Ranger Mark Robinson knew something was wrong. My grandfather was Mark Robinson, who was a ranger and kept a diary every single day. In his diary, he writes about Tom. I alerted the whole community, thinking that Tom must have been in some kind of trouble, for he had been missing for four days. We searched every inch of the park, but there was no sign of him. Then, on the eighth day, his body washes ashore in the last place he was seen. I still find it hard to believe. He claims Tom was a remarkable man who knew the park as well as any ranger. Many of us were astounded by his passing. Tom was a very strong swimmer. There's no doubt in my mind that on such a perfect summer's day, Tom could come to any harm. As far as we can tell from the coroner's report, he went into the water unconscious, but he was drowned. His lungs are full of water. He got drowned in the water. So it's definitely a drowning. How did he get in the water? That's the question. Apparently, he had trolling line around his leg. He had a graze on his forehead three inches long his left forehead. So he may have fallen and hit his head on a grate. Or did someone hit him with his paddle? Because we never, apparently they never found the paddle to his canoe. It is a great mystery. We don't know exactly what happened, and we may never know. Locals speculated about Thompson's private life, a possible love affair with a young woman, possible relationship with a distant novelist, a man who owed him money, did these secrets have anything to do with his death? Perhaps one rumor held more sway than local gossip. The day before he went missing, there was a party at Mowat Lodge. Drunken revelry could be heard echoing across the water. Martin Bletcher, who lived on Canoe Lake, argued with Thompson about the First World War. Bletcher was known for his fiery temper, and before long, the two men came to angry blows. Fletcher warned Thompson to stay out of his way in the future. And perhaps this was not the last time the two men met before Thompson died. It is believed that Tom Thompson was unconscious before he hit the water. After all, how does a drowned corpse bleed? And how could the body have been so near yet undiscovered unless it was weighed down in the water? The bizarre events of the summer of 1917 were far from over for this small Algonquin community. Some days after Thompson was laid to rest, a man dressed like an undertaker arrived at Canoe Lake. He claimed to represent the Thompson family. He said he was to remove Thompson's remains and take them to be interred in the family's plot in Leith Cemetery in Owen Sound. Shortly after these events, Thompson's ghost made its appearance on Canoe Lake. The way my grandfather told the story, he met this Churchill fella right at the town dock. He was to show him where the grave was. He was a sinister looking guy. He wore a long black coat and he had a slouch hat pulled right down over his eyes. He brought his own coffin and he had a big black suitcase. Grandpa offered to help him. He thought they'd start the next day. But Churchill refused. He said he'd do the job himself, and he'd do it that night. Grandpa couldn't understand the urgency. Why did it have to be done right now? They got to the grave site about 9 p.m., and Churchill sent Grandpa on his way. 
that told him to be back by midnight to help carry the casket back to the dock. Things just didn't seem right to Grandpa. He knew he was an undertaker and not a grave robber, but still, it made him feel scary and weary. But who was he to ask questions? After all, it was the Thompson family's wishes. When Grandpa returned to help take the casket back to the dock, the weight felt uneven and lighter than he thought it should be. Churchill said that the ranger had sent some men down to help him. But when Grandpa mentioned it to the ranger the next day, he said he didn't know anything about the procedure. But by then, it was too late. The coffin was sealed and ready to leave the park. My mother was out canoeing on a calm day in the early 30s. She was on a fishing trip with Lauren Harris, one of the group of seven. He was her guide, and they had spent the day crossing the lakes of the park. It was getting towards dusk, and the rest of the party had gone ahead with my mother's boat trailing behind. As she came into the bay by the portage, she swatted a canoe coming out towards them. She said to her guide that someone was coming from the portage to meet them. Then without warning, the paddler and his canoe simply vanished. There was no one making their ways towards them anymore. And there was nothing but themselves and the mist of the growing darkness on the undisturbed lake. The sighting caused a lot of controversy in the family. My father put it down to a mirage. But my mother always believed what Lauren Harris had said that those who pass before their time continue to haunt the places that they love. And this was Tom, his good friend, in the place that he loved the most. The apparition on Canoe Lake is forever tied to the death of Tom Thompson, one of Canada's most treasured painters. Visitors claim they can see, through the mist over the water, the faint outline of a ghostly figure paddling a canoe. Coming up next, the phantom miners who inhabit a historic ghost town. Back when coal fueled the engines of industry, the town of Nordegg, Alberta, was prosperous. But the switch to petroleum eventually turned Nordegg into a ghost town. What started the decline was an event described at the time as the worst mining accident in Canadian history. Coal mining at one point was vital to everything that happened in Canada. In the earlier years of the 20th century, and quite a number of mines were developed, and Nordegg was one of those. I was born in Nordegg, and I took all my school years here, grew up here, the old school and the new school, which is now the museum here. After the town closed in 55, I had completed my first year of teaching and so went on to other things. Once I retired, I was asked if I would consider coming back to Nordegg. One of my grandsons came out to stay with us over the course of the summer while his mother was retraining to go back into the workforce. So the first night that uh, Ryan was here, he uh, had come in to see if I was going to read him a story or what we were going to do, but he was almost falling asleep. Time for you to go to bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> go get washed. So with a, just minimal protesting, he uh, did head off to get himself cleaned up and ready for bed. And he was nervous, uh, scared. I didn't understand why, but uh, he, he said to me, Grandma, Grandma, there's something in there. What's that man in there? But he insisted, he insisted that this was so. And so I said we would go and explore. And of course, when I got there, I didn't see anything. 
But uh, I really don't think he would have made it up. He was, he was scared. And so I've thought of it since and wondered, what did he see? Towns are like people. They're born of great expectations. But for some, tragedy strikes and they wither and die. All that remains of a once thriving community are a few moldering graves in some roadside cemetery. That could have happened to Nordag, Alberta, but for the persistence of a few locals and the ghosts of the miners who still linger here. On October 31st of 1941, all the conditions for an explosion came together. What happened, according to the study that was done later, was that there was a windy shot. This means that the coal, which was supposed to blow into the seam, actually blew back out. The coal dust then mixed with the methane, and you also have a flame, and those are the three requirements for an explosion. bodies of the dead miners were recovered. They were brought out in coal cars to the surface. Everybody was family. This was a catastrophe, and a catastrophe beyond belief. So it was a day that is still remembered sadly by the people of Nordic. I, I knew most of the men, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, I seen all the men as they brought them out of the mine. And there were some awful looking sights that I'll never forget. One man had a horse's hind leg right through his stomach. So things like that you'll never forget. And then they were buried in a cemetery outside of town. At that time, it was outside of town, in a little grove of trees, a very peaceful place. As the town expanded, which it did later, that graveyard for the miners, the 29 miners killed that day, became part of the town itself and was built right next to the school. And so I was reading through one of the books on Martin Nordegg's earlier years, and uh, Chuck said goodnight. Good night. I continued with my work, and then uh, I noticed footsteps in the hall. Well, it wasn't very long when I heard the same thing again, these footsteps going down the hall, quite pronounced. And so this time I thought, well, that is strange. Now there's twice, I wonder if he's not feeling well. So I got up and looked out in the hall, but he wasn't there. Chuck? And there was no sound of him in the bathroom anywhere. So I went into his bedroom and uh, said to him, are you okay? Are you all right? He no, said, why? yes, why? And I said, well, I've heard you up to the bathroom twice and you haven't even been in bed for quite an hour, which just, totally left me speechless. <laughs> but I did go back out and have another look around, and of course I did not see anything. I never have seen anything. But I continue to hear things. There's something special about Nordegg. And of course, coming from Nordegg, there is a certain amount of prejudice there. And anybody from Nordegg will tell you that. This is home. But you find, too, that people who come to visit find that strong attraction, too. And they enjoy being here, they're fascinated by it, and they come back. So is there any wonder that the people who lived here and died here don't want to leave it either? Beacon Hill Park in Victoria, British Columbia, is famous for its tranquil beauty. But it is also known as the setting for one of the strangest paranormal events ever documented. In the early 80s, my wife and I used to get up early in the morning and go jogging in the park. Our regular route took us past this rocky area. We saw a woman there. She seemed to be holding her body in some type of yoga position. Uh, she was slim, had blonde hair, 
and she always had on the same clothes every time we saw her. She had a black top and white pants. She was always facing toward the east, uh, toward the rising sun, and she always had her body in the same position. Her feet were apart, and uh, she had her arms stretched high over her head. Her head was always slightly tilted back, and here's the really strange part. Her mouth was wide open as though she were screaming, but of course there wasn't any sound. The blonde woman was seen by lots of early morning joggers here at beautiful Beacon Hill Park in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. They were marked on her pose and what seemed to be her silent scream. The story we're about to tell you is true. However, we've changed the names of some of the people to protect their real identities. Can you be in two places at once? Watch this and find out. Back in the early 80s, I used to walk my dog through Beacon Hill Park. I remember seeing the woman standing there. She was always standing the same way. She faced east, her legs apart, her hands above her head and her head back a bit. Her mouth was open as if she were trying to shout. The dog started barking and, you know, I just wanted to check and make sure she was okay. So we went over and asked if she was okay. But it was like she didn't even know we existed. At that point, I felt a little bit bad and kind of silly. It occurred to me that maybe she was doing some sort of a spiritual exercise and I'd interrupted her privacy. So I apologized and we left the park. I saw her a couple of times afterwards, but we just left her alone. And then I was really shocked and confused when I read the stories in the paper. I worked at Beacon Hill Park from about 1979 when I was a student at university, and I do remember seeing this woman several times. It was only afterwards I realized I never saw her enter the park or leave the rock. I, I only saw her standing on the rock, always in the early morning and always in the same pose. We were working at the park as part of the groundskeeping crew. One of the jobs was to walk the park, pick up litter, just make sure the park was clean. So it was November, and there were a lot of leaves, of course. It was a beautiful fall, as usual. We work in teams. We were behind the rock, and there was a lot of leaves all bunched up in this one area. I thought I saw an old shoe. So I went over to clear the leaves and pick up the shoe. And that's when I realized there was something wrong. He called over to me. I had a radio, so we radioed in and got the authorities at the park to call the police. The police came and we showed them the spot. They were there for a long time and we, of course, had to wait around to answer questions. So we were there when they took out the body. I couldn't believe what I saw. This was the body of a woman. And I knew who she was the moment I saw her. It was the woman I had seen when I worked mornings, the woman standing on the rock. But something struck me as really odd. I later realized that the woman on the rock had, had blonde hair and tan skin, but the victim had, had was uh, dark hair. She was a brunette and had very pale skin. It was as if the woman on the rock was a negative version of the murder victim. The autopsy revealed the woman had been strangled before she was buried in a shallow grave behind the rock. Her husband had reported her missing several months earlier, but Based on the condition of the body, she had only been dead a short time. Was the murder victim the same woman who had been seen for several years, standing on the rock, just yards from where her body was discovered? And if so, why did she appear in the reverse image of her true self? This is a phenomenon called a doppelganger, a German word that means double walker. Traditionally, it was believed that everyone has a shadow or phantom self and that only the person could see his own doppelganger. But there are many cases that refute this, cases where family members and others have seen the doppelganger, and a number of stories where whole groups of people have seen the doppelganger and the real person at the same time. Generally, however, the person does not know that his doppelganger is being seen, and this is probably a good thing, because to see a doppelganger is an omen of death. This particular case, the screaming doppelganger at Beacon Hill Park is interesting for a number of reasons. First, the doppelganger was seen for many years before the woman was murdered, and it was seen by many people. But most interestingly, she was seen as a negative or reverse image, 
of the way she really was in life. Once the news of this poor woman's murder appeared in the newspapers, many people who had seen her in Beacon Hill Park were shocked and puzzled. But for some, this wasn't the end of the story of the strange woman on the rock. About six weeks after we heard about the murder, my wife and I were out jogging in the park on our regular route when we were stopped dead in our tracks. Up on the rock was the woman again, standing in the same position, her feet apart, arms above her head, her head tilted back, and her mouth open as though she were screaming. And if that isn't enough to stand up the hair on your body, she looked as she did exactly in real life. She had black hair and a pale complexion. She was wearing a white shirt with black pants. And as we stood there, just really stunned, she disappeared. Her appearances on the rock didn't end when her body was found. She's still seen there from time to time, exactly as she was before, in the same pose. But now, it's not the reverse image. It's the way she looked in life. Her murder was never solved. Is this a case of unfinished business? When we come back, the ghostly residents of Mockbagger, Newfoundland. In 1999, in Bonavista Bay, a small community on the eastern coast of Newfoundland, two girls were on their way to work. Already late, one of the girls suggested they take a shortcut. Me and my friend, we were heading to work one morning, and we were a bit late, so she thought it would be a great idea if we went in through Bradley House way. There's a shortcut. It was a route that would take them right past an old, empty house that many people in the town believed was haunted. I have been told stories all my life that there are ghosts there, and I didn't want to go, but she managed to get me to go there. I was terrified, but she's not afraid, see? And she doesn't believe in any of the stories. I don't know how she convinced me to go in, but we walk through, and we get up to the house, and I just stop. I just stop dead in my tracks. And I'm looking in the window, and she's looking in the window. She's telling me, don't worry about it. It's OK, you know, don't worry about it. And then I went cold, cold. And I look over her shoulder, really. And there was this guy, and he had um, really old-fashioned clothes. And I didn't notice a whole lot, because as soon as I saw him and as soon as my friend noticed him, we just took off. Bonavista Bay in eastern Newfoundland is home to one of the richest and oldest cultures in all of North America. For the first brave souls landed on these shores over 500 years ago, the area was to be a stopping off point, a gateway to the mysteries of a new world. But it seems that some who arrived here have since decided to make it their permanent home, a place where they would live forever, well, at least in spirit. There are sightings of ghosts in the Bonavista area at all times of day and night. Mostly, the ghosts just seem to be going about their business in the spirit world, but sharing the physical space with the living. No one knows who the ghosts are or where they came from. The history of the place goes back a long way, but the origin of the ghosts is a mystery. I think uh, that the whole area that of the Macbeger area is, is a haunted place, I think. Uh, people in the area know that, and they appreciate that. Many of the paranormal incidents in the area center around Bradley House, a stately home, once part of the Mockbegger Plantation, a fish hatchery. The ghosts that live here, they were here before us, and we're only visitors to their home, just as the visitors come every day to visit the house and we give them a guided tour of the house. We are also just visitors to the families that would have lived here before. A lot of the people in the area here would be scared to walk past this house because of what they might see or what they may possibly hear. There is a story of the old lady that is seen in the bedroom window upstairs. You see a light up in the windows there, uh, and there is no electricity in the house, so there is no reason for there to be a light there. So people did see that as they were, uh, they were walking past. The mysterious woman at the window has also been seen outside the house. 
People have reported seeing an elderly woman coming in the gate. Others have seen the gates opening and closing when no one was there. It's a very old home, and there's a lot of different families that have lived here over the years. And in, the, in those days, there were no funeral homes and places to go. So people would have died in the house. And oftentimes, when people die in the house, they don't really want to leave home. And I think uh, that's a lot of the reason why there, are so much, there is so much unrest here in the house. Bradley House is only one of the haunted areas of Mockbeggar. The nearby point is the site of another eerie mystery. Out on Moses Point, um, there was a story of uh, a young boy that I'm not sure if he was playing there or he was up on the cliff side there. It's quite high. And um, I'm told fell over and drowned there. So uh, when a storm is brewing and the wind is coming from the north, you always hear um, people tell you that they'd see a light off the point shining, shining off the point area there. And they see the image of uh, a young boy in the shadow. And if you stare at it, stare at it, it comes toward you. And if you continue to stare at it, it will come right toward you and pull you off the cliff as well. And so they, they tell you, you shouldn't continue looking at it. You should turn away, because if you continue to look at it, something may happen to you as well. So that's one of the stories there on Moses Point. Perhaps the most intriguing mystery of Mockbeggar concerns the discovery of numerous coffins emerging from the ground they were buried in hundreds of years ago. Many years ago, uh, a channel was dug from O'Day's Pond here uh, to drain the water off from the pond and into the ocean here. And when they did that, they found several coffins and caskets there buried in the, in the soil there. And when they dug up the, the caskets, they found that the bodies that were in the room very well preserved because of the boggy area that were in here. And uh, they were dressed in a Puritan-style clothing, which was very... Uh, unusual for us in the area. It's not familiar to our area at all. And so um, they dug these coffins up and they reburied them out on Moses Point, the same area that this young boy had drowned. And as the sea is on our coastline here, it gets quite treacherous. And apparently the sea had come in over the years and had washed the bodies away. And so it's said that there's a lot of spirits in unrest here because of these bodies that were dug up through the trench area and were never found and never reburied. We're not really sure where these bodies came from or what their origins are really. And because of all the coffins that are buried in the Macbeger area, it, it's thought to be a haunted because of that reason. At first it was, may have been rumored that it may have been some French people because there was a lot of fighting between the French and the English along the coast of Newfoundland over the years. And it was thought that it may have possibly been a French burial ground at one point. But the clothing that they were wearing uh, was more Puritan in style, and so we're not really sure where these bodies came from or what their origins are really. The identity of these bodies and the mystery surrounding the coffins so intrigued renowned psychic Shelley Stokes that she braved gale force winds to communicate with their spirits. She made contact with a ghost named Thomas. The man Thomas that I was picking up on and talking with, he was telling me about the point that I had to go to the point that a lot of his people were buried in graves on the point. But I do believe that they were attacked and probably killed by a group of English. Now, it's something we'd have to check into the history to find out the details on it. This man, Thomas, was talking about Quaker people and that he was a Quaker. He explained to me that the Puritans killed their people. They were classed as heretics by the Puritans. Somewhere in this vicinity was a house that they used as a meeting house. Uh, they didn't have churches, they had meeting houses, and they would get together two and three times a week for church meetings. I just think he wants people to know his story, to know that they existed. And it's as if he had a mission to accomplish, and he still feels that he has to do that. I don't think he's ready to move on. It seems like that he was attached to this place. I don't feel that he's ready to move on. We may never know if the bodies in the coffins are indeed Quakers murdered hundreds of years ago. But Bonavista Bay is a place where the living and the dead share a home.